Welcome to the Canadian edition of The Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. That word that he meditates on day and night w was coming out in his teaching, and it was coming into my heart. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today, I'm teaching through a series I've entitled Lessons from Joseph. And I have a book on this that is brand new. First time we've released this book. And uh, this is a 200 plus page book. We are asking for a donation of any amount. We want you to have this, but we do need you to give something towards that. If people, if, you know, if nobody gave, we couldn't do this. We'll have, I don't know, 60 or 70,000 of these books that we'll give out. And I've also given a brief introduction to it. If for some reason you couldn't give anything, we have this as an absolute free gift to you. It's introduction to lessons from Joseph. And so we've got those two things. And then we've got CDs and DVDs that are taken from my television program. And I've got a USB that will have the audio and video on the USB. And we'll be giving out that information at the end of the program. I've already spent two days introducing this out of the 37th chapter of the book of Genesis. And this is where the story of Joseph starts. And he was the favorite son of his father. His father made him a coat of many colors. Because his father favored Joseph over all of the other brothers, the other 11 brothers hated him and persecuted him. And then he had two dreams from God that he was going to be exalted and others would come and bow down to him. And man, that just aggravated the situation. And so his brothers hated him because of that. And I spent all of yesterday just talking about how important it is to have God give you a vision of where your life is going and what he wants to do in you and through you. And I spent all yesterday doing that. I'm not going to go back through all of that, but that is so important. And most people just do not have a clear vision of what God created them for. You know, I minister all around the world and I've taught on these things many, many times. And I will give an invitation uh, to people. And these are people that come to a meeting. It's not just a Sunday service. They're nod to God crowd. But these are people that come midweek. These are the fanatics, or it was either somebody that was drugged there by a fanatic. And these are people that are relatively on fire for God compared to just the average person that claims to be a Christian. And yet I'll give an invitation after I've taught on these things and say, if you don't know for sure that what you're doing is what God created you for, if you're just letting circumstances drive your life and you're doing whatever it takes just to survive and get along, well then stand up and let me pray for you that God will give you revelation. And I usually have at least 70 to 80 percent of the congregation stand up and say that they don't know for sure what God has called them to do. And I tell you, you aren't going to get there accidentally. You aren't going to get there sovereignly. God doesn't just manipulate your life. You have to have a purpose, a direction for your life. And that's what God did with Joseph. He burned these dreams into his heart that someday he was going to be in a position where people would come bow down to him. And because of that, that's what preserved him and kept him going all of those years. Man, that is powerful. So the story goes on that after all of these things had happened, after he had these dreams, uh, his, uh, actually this was just 10 of his 11 brothers because Benjamin was very young and he was still at home. But 10 of his brothers were out feeding the flocks and uh, they, they were away from home. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, uh, gave him some food and things like this and sent him to go find his brothers and give them these things and find out how they were doing. Apparently they were gone weeks or maybe months at a time, probably, uh, you know, following the grasslands and things like this for a season. So they could have been gone months at a time. And so Joseph was sent by his father to go uh, bring these things to his brothers. And his brothers, when they saw him afar off, this is in Genesis chapter 37, verse 18, it says, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him 
to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. And, uh, you know, they already hated him before his dreams, but when his dreams came about, he was going to be exalted and they would bow down to him. They hated him more. They resented this and they were never going to, on their own free will, bow down to Joseph. And so they said, This dreamer cometh. And they said, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And so here he is going, doing what his father told him to do, being obedient, and yet his brothers conspired to kill him. You know, this is something that a lot of people miss in this story. But again, you need to know some of the background. Reuben was the firstborn son of Jacob, and yet Reuben committed incest with another one of Jacob's wives. He went in and defiled her, and because of this, Jacob cursed him. And this was an evil man. He committed incest with the stepmother. And then Simeon and Levi were number two and number three born sons. Simeon and Levi went into a city, and there was a prince, the son of the king of this city, and he had had sexual relationships with Diana, which was their sister. That was a daughter of Jacob. And because of this, they lied to the man, and they went in and killed every man in that city. We don't know the number, but it was hundreds of people that they went and killed them all. And then they took all of the women and the children and the animals as, uh, you know, spoil from the city. And because of this, Jacob said, man, you've put me in a place that everybody's going to come kill me. And yet the fear of the Lord fell on them and God protected them. But these are the oldest three sons of uh, Jacob, a man who committed incest with one of his stepmothers. The other two sons killed hundreds of people, took all of the women and children captive. And then the fourth son of Jacob was named Judah. And Judah is a man who in the 38th chapter of the book of Genesis, he committed incest with his daughter-in-law. His son had died, and he actually had sexual relationships with his daughter-in-law, and she had twins out of that. And so these are the first four sons. They were evil people. They were mean people. And you can see that right here because when they saw him coming out of jealousy, they were going to kill uh, Jake, uh, Joseph. So these were evil people, and sometimes people don't understand this. And later on in the story, when they come before Joseph and he's in Egypt, this is the reason that he was so hard on them. It wasn't vengeance. It wasn't getting even with them for the way that they had treated him. It was him, it was Joseph being inspired by God to bring these guys to the end of themselves. And later when we get over there, I'll bring this out uh, even more clearly, but Joseph specifically said that he was doing these things so that they could humble themselves. And finally, they came to a place, we're guilty, and they humbled themselves. And they were willing to literally put their life on the line to save the life of uh, Benjamin. And so there's a, you need to understand these things to get the full impact. But here is Joseph going down to his brothers. They plan on killing him. And in verse 21, it says, Reuben, this is the oldest son, the one that committed incest with the stepmother, says, when he heard it, he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. You know, let me just say some things here, and I'm not going to be able to go into great detail on this, but some people just that believe that God is sovereign and stuff, they believe that God ordained that the brothers hated uh, Joseph. I do not believe that. God is not the one that causes us to hate people. They believe that God is the one who orchestrated Joseph being sold into slavery and that God will put terrible things on you and lead you through these things to break you and to humble you, etc. I do believe that God is the one who inspired these brothers to sell Joseph into slavery, but it wasn't because that was God's perfect will. It was because they were trying to kill him. And he even put into the heart of Reuben, this man who committed incest with his mother and, uh, you know, stepmother, he put it into his heart to save uh, Joseph's life. If God hadn't have intervened, he, uh, these brothers would have killed him. God doesn't just flow external 
and intervene in the affairs of man. He always has to flow through somebody. So in this case, he raised up Reuben, and Reuben tried to save the life of Joseph and, and said that instead of killing him, let's just put him in this pit and we'll let him die of natural causes, but that way we won't be responsible for his death. And Reuben planned on coming back later and saving him and delivering him back to his father. So God used a person to stop these brothers from doing what they wanted to do. And then while Reuben was off, probably tendering, tending the flocks and stuff, the other brothers saw some Midianites coming down on their way to Egypt. And they said, hey, we, instead of just letting him die in this pit, we could sell him to these Midianites and these Ishmaelites, and we can make some money off of him. You know, the scripture says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, again, God didn't make them want to take their brother and sell them. That wasn't God's perfect will, but it was better than them killing him. And I believe that the Lord took their love of money, this greed, and used it to save Joseph from these brothers. So some people think that this was God's perfect plan all along. I'm not sure it was a perfect plan. I, it was probably plan B or plan C, depending upon what the brothers were doing, but it turned out to be to Joseph's advantage because it kept the brothers from killing him. Now, these are important things. And, you know, I, I do believe this, that as much as we depend upon a GPS thing and, you know, you're taking directions from your GPS device. And if you make a wrong turn, that thing just recalculates and it can get you back on target. It doesn't matter how far off target you are. You, he can get you back on target. This doesn't mean that this was the perfect way that God had of getting Joseph into this position. And yet when there were wrong turns made and the brothers were trying to kill him, he was able to use whatever they did and work it together for good. This is what Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is saying. It didn't say that everything that happens comes from God, but it does say that whatever happens, if you are interceding and letting the Holy Spirit intercede with you, and if you love God and if you're called according to His purpose, God will make whatever the devil throws at you come together for good. And so here's another lesson, see, that we can learn from Joseph, that this wasn't God's perfect plan, that God intervened through people and kept Joseph from being killed. And so these brothers took him, put him in the pit, wound up selling him to the Ishmaelites, and then they took his coat of many colors that Jacob had given him as a sign of him being the favorite son, and they killed one of the animals and put the animal blood upon Joseph's coat. And then they went back to their father, and uh, it says here in verse 31, it says, and they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or not. And of course it was, this was a unique coat. It was obvious that this was Joseph's coat. And in verse 33, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Boy, here's another lesson that you can learn from this thing. And uh, it goes on to say that uh, Jacob, he began to mourn and his children tried to comfort him and he refused to be comforted. He says, I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. And we know that it was 22 years before uh, Jacob found out that Joseph was still alive and was in Egypt and was now the ruler over all of Egypt. So for 22 years, Jacob grieved over a situation that was not accurate. And he looked at things like a coat with blood on it and just jumped to the conclusion that some evil beast had killed him. He didn't know what had really happened. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, so much of our grief, so much of our stuff is because we aren't looking at things properly because we don't see things. I've actually talked, there's a woman that we have a video about. We produced a little testimony. It was just a two minute interview that we did with her, but she had a little girl that died and she was grieving even to the point of committing suicide. She wanted to be with her daughter so much. And she heard my teaching about how to deal with grief. And she realized that instead of looking at it as like this 
girl was just totally gone. She realized that her daughter was with the Lord and that she would meet her someday. And she began to start thanking God for the time that she had with her. She thanked the Lord that this girl was now with the Lord. And I tell you, this lady has been totally set free and you see her today and she's rejoicing and going on with her life. There's a lot of people that don't look at things properly. I remember when my brother, uh, his wife died in a car wreck and they had been married for like, I don't know, 30 or something years, had two children and they were super close. She had some uh, physical things, arthritis and stuff. And my brother uh, really took care of her and they were super close and she died in this car wreck. And when she did, uh, my brother went in a tailspin. And of course I went to the funeral and I called him and I would talk to him and uh, he was just struggling. And then I don't remember what period of time, it was just a few months later, I called him and all of a sudden he was just back to himself. It was like he was just over it. And I was shocked. And I said, what happened? And he said, he of course was praying about all this and the Lord just spoke to him. And he says, you're either going to have to dig a hole next to your wife and crawl in and die with her, or you need to get on with your life and you need to trust me. And so he just, he just threw that care over on the Lord, got over it. And I forget the exact amount of time, but in a year or two after that, he met another lady and they've now been married for 20 years or something like that. And it's just amazing. God has blessed him and they have a great relationship. But I'm saying there's, there's a lot of people that just make this same decision that Jacob did. And let me just continue to read. It says in verse 34 that Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and moored for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And so he just refused to be comforted. There are some people watching this program that you refuse to be comforted. And I'm not saying you haven't had tragedy. I'm not saying bad things haven't happened. But I am saying that Jesus bore our sorrows and carried our grief out of Isaiah chapter 53. And you are bearing something that you don't have to bear. You can cast your care over on the Lord. And Joseph was still alive. Jacob was mourning over something that hadn't happened. Now, there, it was terrible that his brothers had sold him into slavery, but it wasn't as bad as him being torn in pieces by some beast. He was mourning over something that he shouldn't have been mourning over. And there are people watching this program that you are mourning over something, and I'm not saying it's not terrible, but you, you shouldn't go down to the grave mourning. You shouldn't refuse to be comforted because Jesus said that he bore your sorrows and carried your grief. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says that He comforts us in all of our tribulation that we may know how to comfort others that are also in a similar situation. There is supernatural comfort from God. And regardless of what's happened to you today, regardless of what's just broken your heart, the Scripture said Jesus, His very first message in the synagogue in Nazareth, He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. There is an anointing on Jesus to heal your broken heart. And I believe that God is speaking to people right now, reaching out to people that you've just refused to be comforted. And you know what? You need to put this behind you. Again, I'm not saying that it's not tragic. I'm not saying that there isn't a place for you, uh, you know, for a brief period of time dealing with things, but to just refuse to be comforted and live the rest of your life like this, this is not what God's intended. And there is an anointing upon Jesus. There's an anointing on this program right now. God is speaking to people. And if you'll receive it, your grief can be broken today. You just need to call out to God. And you need to let him come in and, and bear your sorrows and carry your griefs as Jesus has already done. And you need to cast this grief over on the Lord. J Jacob suffered for 22 years in a way that he didn't have to suffer. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to spend the rest of your life this way. Man, this is one of the great things that you can learn through this story of Joseph. And so Joseph was sold into slavery and the story 
uh, continues in chapter 39. Chapter 38 is just a brief interlude, and it goes to talking about Judah. He was the fourth born son of Jacob, and Judah had uh, three sons. And the first one was so evil that it says that God killed him. And he was married, and so according to the custom of that day, the brother had to go in and raise up seed to the deceased brother. And so the first child that was born of that union was not counted as his son. It was counted as the son of the brother who had died. And he didn't want to do that, and so he refused to do it, and God killed the second son. And because of that, uh, the youngest son, his name was Selah, and he was uh, too young to give in marriage. And so he promised the widow of these first two boys that when the youngest son got old enough, he would give him to that woman so that uh, he could raise up seed to the two previous brothers. And yet he didn't do it. I suspect that Judah probably didn't want him being slain because of some iniquity. And so anyway, the son was now old enough that he could have married this woman and, he, and uh, Judah wouldn't give uh, the son to the woman. And so the woman dressed up as a prostitute and enticed Judah and he went in and had sexual relationships with her, with, uh, with the girl. And anyway, when the uh, girl went back home, it was told Judah, that she was pregnant and she was a widow. She was waiting on this youngest son. And Judah got so mad that he brought her in front of him and reamed her out and said that he was going to burn her for her sin. And then she produced the ring and the staff that was Judah's that he had given in pledge to this woman when he thought she was just a prostitute. He didn't realize it was his own daughter-in-law. And she said, this is the man's uh, staff and ring that got me pregnant. And, and Judah realized that she was more righteous than him, and so he repented. And anyway, she had two children, had twins out of this. That's what's recorded in this 38th chapter, kind of an interlude in the story of Joseph. But this, this makes the point that Judah and Simeon and Levi and Reuben were evil, evil men. And a lot of what happened with Joseph wasn't only to save the Egyptians. It wasn't only to save uh, Jacob and his household. But God used Joseph to bring these evil men to the end of themselves, to where they actually were willing to lay down their life. And they were willing to go into slavery and become slaves if... Uh, you know, the master of Egypt would just release Benjamin and let him go back. And they were doing this for their father because he was an old man, and they said it would kill him if Benjamin was kept. And so these guys were actually brought to the end of themselves, to a place to where they repented, and that's what God used Joseph to do. So this is a powerful story. Anyway, we're going to continue this on our program tomorrow. I've got this little booklet that is a brief introduction to this story, but this is so detailed that I really encourage you to get the entire book. This is a brand new book, first time we've put this out. It's a 200 plus page book, and we are asking for a donation of any amount for the book. We'll give you the introduction as a free gift, and then we also have DVDs and CDs or a USB they will have the audio and video on it. So listen to our announcer and please call or write today. I'd like to encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people and you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the scripture says, if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. Call that number on your screen. We'd love to pray with you. My nine-year-old daughter, Lena Love, passed away a little over a year ago. She was dealing with asthma and a viral infection. One morning, she transitioned to heaven instead of going to school. A few days after she went to Jesus, there was a moment where I wanted to end my life so that I could see her. So at one point during the early morning, I woke up hearing Andrew Womack explaining how I had so much to be grateful for. And I turned my mind towards the things that he was naming that I should be thankful for. God was speaking to me. He was saying, relax, I have her. She's with me. 
No one can care for her like I can. Andrea, live. Two months later, I enrolled in Karis Bible College, Atlanta, and it was the best decision I could have made. God used Karis Atlanta to help me stay focused on the spiritual things, God's love, His grace, and so much more. To know Him is to live life free from all forms of death, including depression. So being at Karis is God's way of comforting my heart so I can comfort others. God has used Karis to fortify my life with such encouragement. And so now I want to pour out that encouragement on others like never before. Can you imagine what Andrea's life would have been like if it hadn't been for the Word of God that turned her around? And here she is just praising God. This is what we see happening through Karis Bible College. And we've got so many people that are just like Andrea that need this Word, and yet we have to have help in order to build out our campus. We are in a building project that's gonna be hundreds of millions of dollars. If you would like to be a part of it, I encourage you to go to awmi.net. You can look at the proposed buildings and you can also sign up and become a foundation builder with us today. Andrew is offering his booklet, Lessons from Joseph, as his free gift to you today. This booklet is limited to one free booklet per household. This offer is available in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete series, Lessons from Joseph, is available as a book, newly updated CD album, TV, DVD album, and USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources is available when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download, absolutely free from our website. We also want to remind you of Andrew's Living Commentary software. The Living Commentary includes more than 50 years of Andrew's Bible study notes and personal encounters with God. Get Andrew's Living Commentary today for $135. Go to our website at awmc.ca to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada Helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order. I'd like to let all of you, our Canadian viewers, know that we have a Bible college in Toronto. And we would love to have you come and be a part of it. There's multiple ways you can take advantage, not only through the campus there in Toronto, but we have online courses, we have correspondence courses, uh, just a number of ways. But we want to help you, and we're making it as available to you as we possibly can. So check it out with the information's on your screen, our Carius Bible College, Toronto. To learn more about the vision and mission of Andrew Womack Ministries Canada, be sure to visit our website at awmc.ca. While there, you'll also find details about all of the products available and be able to access many of Andrew's teachings absolutely free. You can listen to them while you're online or download them for later and listen on the go. Remember, that's awmc.ca.